you know, tell us why nutrition, these topics are important for the metastatic community specifically. Yeah, so uh, thanks to Jean and to LBBC for having me here again. It's, uh, it is nice to get back in person and to see some familiar faces. Um, so I'll sort of take it back a little bit to not just nutrition per se, but integrative oncology and what that means. There's, the definition of integrative oncology has evolved a lot over the years. And I think you know, you've, some of you may have heard me say the language is important here because I think there's, there's some misconceptions about what that means. And, and I always like to divide alternative medicine and integrative medicine. So integrative medicine, the way I define it, is the best of both worlds. So complementary medicine, conventional medicine coming together in an evidence-based way to take care of patients. And I think patients, for the most part, most of you would look at integrative oncology for three reasons. There's the ability to improve immune function. There's the ability to mitigate symptoms to allow you to improve your quality of life. And then potentially impact outcomes in a positive way. So that's, that's my general definition of it. Thank you. And Rachel, why don't you do the same thing, but maybe also just give a little bit more about your background so everyone knows ki the kinds of questions they could direct towards you. Sure, sure. So um, I, as Jean mentioned, I'm the founder of the Bella Nutritional Institute, and I'm based out of Los Angeles, but I work with patients nationwide. Um, and I started my career in the research setting. Um, I was involved in the WINS trial, which looked at the prevention, women's prevention nutrition study, looking at the prevention of recurrence of breast cancer through dietary modifications. Um, and I was engaged with that as a site coordinator for 10 years. Um, and continued my career in the space of nutrition and breast cancer. The amount of evidence that we have to date is just amazing in how nutrition plays a role when it comes to thrivership, when it comes to cancer protection, and it gives patients an opportunity to be very proactive when it comes to their health and understanding how to integrate nutrition um, no matter what stage you're at. And um, it's very empowering, and I'm very passionate about uh, educating women and individuals about the role of nutrition. And the key for me is to really, um, th the key thing is to translate nutritional science into realistic, actionable solutions. So we have all this science, but then the secret sauce is how do we simplify it so that um, the individuals on the receiving end can actually go into action mode in a way that feels realistic for their lives, and they have a strategy and a game plan and a protocol, and they really have that clarity and confidence to take it on. That is where it's at because we get so much information and so much noise, little tips and pieces, whether it's on Instagram, we just get little, should I take this, should I do this? And I like to step back and to actually say, look, we're gonna build a house together, and we're gonna do it from the ground up, and we really need to put down a good solid foundation that's evidence-based. And once we have that, then we start with, um, it could be different supplements and power foods and different things, we can get creative, but that foundation is really where I find that there's a missing uh, gap. Yeah, that's helpful. And, and I will say, Rachel has a lot of practical tips, which is I think what we all need when we're trying to change the way we eat. So there are a lot of questions. So, Dr. Mehta, let's switch away from nutrition for a minute. And we're getting a lot of questions about sleep, fatigue. Um, you know, you're supposed to get seven or eight hours a night. I think a lot of people are saying that's not possible. What, what, so what can people do to improve their sleep? And then what's a realistic amount that they should be aiming for? Yeah, so, um, and I want to mention, actually, I'm really excited to be here with Rachel. Yeah. Uh, because um, my, my wife is doing the master class. And, Every morning now, I have uh, oat, the uh, overnight oats that are ready for me, uh, which are great. All this extra energy. Um, Our next program it? starts That's on right. June 3rd. There you go. See? And I'm wearing hamburgers on my socks. I, that was not intentional. <laughs> um, so, um, so sleep. I mean, it's a, that's a, it, it's a complex question. We could probably talk all day about the issue of sleep and how sleep impacts quality of life and 
and is there a potential connection to cancer? You know, the research, like most things in, in medicine, has evolved a lot. There was a time where we said everyone needs eight hours, and then little by little we realized there is individualization to this. I think the, the research suggests now that most people need at least six. So under six hours um, seems to impact health in a few different ways, whether it's from inflammation, it increases the risk of obesity, it definitely increases the risk of, of mental health issues. Um, we think it might impact uh, menopausal symptoms, so women either going through menopause naturally or for a lot of women who might be here today, we are the reason that you're going into menopause. Our treatments um, often induce it or we're doing it on purpose. Um, you know, getting a good night's sleep, there's lots of, I think most of you know kind of what sleep hygiene means. Um, you know, the right temperature in the room, trying to have the same cycles every night, going to bed the same night, you know, same time every night, waking up the same time every morning. Um, when you figure that out, let me know. <laughs> Tough to do. Um, and then I think for some, particularly, again, the women in this room, treatments impact sleep, as you've seen. Um, hormonal treatments impact sleep. Chemotherapy certainly can impact sleep. And so I think it's even more relevant for, for those women to try to keep those sleep hygiene habits as good as they can. Um, there are times where you'll wake up in the middle of the night because of various symptoms. And when you do wake up, we, we all know about blue light, uh, blue light and, and melatonin, which I'm sure we'll get into. Um, there's, there's good evidence that, that that impacts melatonin release and impacts sleep and, and the ability to get into sort of that deeper sleep. Um, sleep medications are something that, that sometimes people need. I think we try, if possible, to do it in a, in a more natural way. There are natural substances that can help with sleep, but it doesn't mean you can't take a sleep medication, a prescription medication, if you need it. Because if you're just not sleeping, you need a medicine to sleep, that's okay. Okay. So Rachel, there is a, and then I'm gonna go back and forth with my colleague who's, who's taking the other questions, but um, there's a question about what are, what are like the five superfoods that you should, <laughs> you should try to get that don't interfere with chemotherapy? So I don't know if you can add into that as well, but. Sure, I think, well, one thing I do wanna say is that there's no single diet or food that can uh, prevent or cure cancer. That's right off the bat. Um, there are foods that we highlight, and I would say more, um, I'd say five maybe principles that would be great to uh, integrate. Um, so something like um, fiber, as everyone uh, kind of hears about, and we all hear about the importance of fiber and its role uh, when it comes to thrivership. I think what is important is to um, also realize that about, you know, if I, if I were to say to everyone in this room, you know, does anybody uh, understand that fiber is so important? Everyone would raise their hand and everyone seems to know it, but only 3% of Americans are really meeting their fiber goal. And when it comes to um, breast cancer protection, I generally recommend about 35 grams for my patients, and that's a general recommendation. So I think that would be one key thing, or maybe one of the first things that I would recommend for someone to start looking at as far as integration. Um, so looking at the total amount, where the fiber is coming from is key, because it shouldn't come from a bar or a powder. It needs to come from natural, wholesome foods. And then once you understand the target number that you're aiming for, then going into diversification of your fiber sources, because ultimately the goal is to um, contribute to, your, to the um, healthy bacteria in your gut microbiome, because that has an impact on your immune, uh, immune system, on weight management, um, it, it, it really is so important to tend to that garden in your gut, and fiber is one key thing. And I'm, I'm, I'm elaborating on it because it's something that people think that they really are getting if they're eating a few salads a day or a bunch of vegetables, but it, it requires a lot more than that. So that's, that's a strategy I start my patients on, looking at that comprehensively. It could take a couple weeks just to get to that target number and to start diversifying it. So that's one. <laughs> so do you want to tell, 
tell the audience what are some of those sources that sure. aren't in a bar or you know a sure. sear of sure. processed cereal where you sure. think you're getting fiber. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I'm happy to get specific with that. So I usually tell my patients to look at their morning routine. And ideally, you want to strive for about 10 grams of fiber before noon, um, because that gets you off to a high note on it's get it started on a on a good in a good place. So you could do something like sprouted rolled oats, for example, which I, I'm glad you're enjoying every morning. <laughs> I'm usually, apparently. Usually yeah, his wife's uh, taking my current <laughs> master class, and we've got that's our starting point. So um, rolled oats or steel cut oats, and then that gives you about four grams of fiber. So we're trying wow, to get to a lot. It's, it's not. <laughs> it's not. Um, and, and you know what? When we're looking at 30 to 35 grams yeah. of fiber in a day, when we rely on vegetables, that's about nine humongous spinach salads with all kinds of vegetables, which is unrealistic. So now we say, okay, let's get it real. So we start the day with um, oatmeal, and then I like to recommend adding a fiber booster. And a fiber booster would be something like basil seeds, ground sprouted flax, uh, chia seeds. Some people add a little psyllium. You have to play around with different types of fiber boosters to see which one works best for you. But if you're adding, let's say, a tablespoon of chia or basil seeds, there's another five grams of fiber. So now you're at nine. And then you're going to add some berries. You're going to end up at 12. And that's a good foundation to start with put a little bit of a plant-based milk. Um, I'm really into power spicing, so um, you can add um, a combination of Ceylon cinnamon and some other spices to dramatically level up the antioxidant value. So, and there's so many things that you can add to it, but your foundation would be that type of a breakfast. Um, and there are other things. You could do a sprouted flourless bread, and you can integrate a spread. You can add a fiber booster to that. There are multiple ways to easily get to 12, but the key thing is that it's all coming from natural, wholesome food and not um, isolated type of fibers that have been manufactured. You can add those, but that's later. Got it. First the food. All so, right. yeah. All right, so fiber, everyone. Fiber up. And, and if I can just, I can just yeah, add to ahead. that, that you know, 35 sounds like a lot, but it's actually the national recommendations. You know, we're really good at getting all sorts of pro the protein recommendations. We tend to be really great at, <laughs> but for whatever reason, the fiber recommendations are are around 30 to 35. Yeah. And so it's it, it is not it's not easy to get to that point. But I like the idea of a graduated approach. Yeah. Um, I think some of my patients have tried to suddenly increase, and all of a sudden. The, the effect is constipation mm -hmm. um, and, and the impact of fiber on insulin and, and that potential connection to certain types of breast cancer. There's just all sorts of data, so I'm yeah. on the same page. All right, I'm gonna let Kathy ask a question from our virtual audience, right? Okay, yes, we have quite a few questions on weight gain. Um, and if you could address them for younger patients as well as older patients and maybe start with Dr. Maida and then Rachel. Yeah, again, sort of a, a broad topic, you know, weight gain. What does that mean? I think for, and we'll sort of focus on metastatic breast cancer here, and, and you know, it depends on the patient. Uh, there's, there's this stereotype of what a metastatic cancer patient looks like. When, when you hear the word stage four cancer, the impression that immediately goes off, maybe not in your heads, because many of you are, are doing well, but it's this emaciated cancer patient lying in bed not able to move. And so the, the last thing you think about is the potential issues of weight gain. But you know, breast cancer, one of the reasons I love treating it and I've been treating it for almost 20 years, is that there's been tremendous progress. And I think you mentioned, Jean, that 17 years ago there was somebody here. Yeah, and that's not, it's getting less and less unusual to see that. And so we're starting to see issues with long-term management that decades ago weren't anything we thought about. And if you, you know, some oncologists in those days, and maybe some now, are worried about, for example, weight loss, you know? And I think there's a, there's a misconception about that. So if, if women are losing weight unintentionally, it can sometimes, sometimes mean that there's a progression of cancer going on. Not always, by the way. But weight loss, so it's the cause and effect, weight loss does not mean cancer gets worse. So if you're doing it in a healthy way, 
particularly for women that maybe have a little higher BMI, losing weight in a healthy way with metastatic breast cancer is okay. And, and you may want to ask your oncologist to explain that to you as in case those recommendations have been slightly conflicting. But, but it is okay to lose weight if you do it in a healthy way. Fiber is a good way to do it. Calories, how you, met, you know, eat throughout the day. Now certain foods will affect, I mean certain uh, treatments will affect your taste buds and will affect your gut and, and bowel symptoms and whatnot. So there's some, some caveats there. But, but weight loss is okay if done in a healthy way. Um, weight gain. So we, there is evidence that, particularly in postmenopausal women, uh, with certain types, the estrogen uh, positive types of breast cancers, that obesity may increase certain hormones and certain inflammatory mediators in the blood that can have some impact on cancer. Again, I, I don't. I want to be careful here, you know, not putting out a message that, you know, gaining a few pounds will suddenly make your cancer worse, but managing weight can be an important part of managing cancer, particularly for metastatic breast cancer. Yeah. And, uh, and in my, um, my master class that I have online every eight weeks, we have quite a, a, a strong group of metastatic breast cancer patients who are coming in just, just for that. We're, we're syncing up weight management and uh, breast cancer protection, nutritional strategies, and I, I can't stress enough, and you're absolutely right in approaching it um, gradually with a phased approach, but um, it has been shown to help with thrivership, and it is, it is important. A lot of oncologists are referring patients for that reason, um, but again, it's very individualized, and it's something that needs to be um, managed in a, in a gradual sense, but also decreasing, um, you know, excess body fat and increasing your muscle mass is really, really where it's at as well. So, so tying that together is important. Um, a lot of patients feel discouraged, like, I, I can't, I'll eat lettuce and I'll gain weight, and I'll take on those challenges. Um, it, it is definitely something that um, you need to uh, approach with uh, with that kind of a phased approach, but it can be done, and it and it's something that is very empowering once you start to feel like you've got that clarity and confidence when it comes to what you're eating, and you're seeing and experiencing those results in a way that feels like it's uh, aligned with your treatment protocol. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned. I, we know it's frustrating for a lot of you know yes. people once they're in treatment, and it losing weight is never easy and I know it, it's it's harder so I do think it's this like whole shifting the way you eat overall but not starving yourself no but actually, so, you know, just to mention just one thing about weight the definition of of obesity the definition of overweight we're really starting to challenge some of the the criteria you know everyone knows body mass index and you know we've known for years that BMI doesn't always correlate well with health and we're starting to change some of those particularly for women um, where weight in and of itself maybe isn't the right way to look at this, that maybe it's the distribution of weight that has a, a you know, weight that might more be what we call visceral, which is in the, in the middle, maybe that's a different kind of uh, fat cell than the cells that are seen in other parts of the body. Um, but this research is, is going on, and I think we're gonna start to see some, some changes. You know, overnight, about 10, 15 years ago, millions of people became overweight because yeah. <laughs> the definition changed. Yes. Um, so the, that, those definitions are evolving. So just, you know, stay tuned. Yeah, I was reading about that and that you can be thin and be not healthy. Mm -hmm. So it's good to know. So yeah. I think we have to answer the question about intermittent fasting because there's like <laughs> five people that asked it. So I don't, either one of you can take it on. <laughs> Do you want to start? You, I will let you take okay. that on. <laughs> um, a lot of my patients opt to intermittent fast. I think one of the, and it's fine to do that, it's fine. I think it's good to give your body rest. Um, my biggest challenge back to my patients is what happens in the window when they're eating? Okay. No, really, that is so important because they fo we focus so much on, I'm gonna stop eating around 8 p.m. and I'm gonna start eating around 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. and that's totally fine. It's actually normal for a lot of people and that's great, but they're so focused on the timing and there are advantages to the timing because not eating two hours before bed is advisable 
anyways. It's good. It's better for your sleep. Um, and in the morning, I think also um, starting a little later is totally fine. What I see most, com most commonly in my practice, what I'm seeing is that the focus is on the intermittent fasting where the key principles when it comes to nutrition are kind of lost. Like I'll start asking questions, well, in that smaller window of eating, are you meeting your 35, 40 grams of fiber? Are you diversifying them? How are you doing with your um, premium proteins? Are you integrating? And, and it kind of gets lost a little bit. And that's really, really important because you don't want to let go of that. So for example, if I'm recommending about 10, 12 grams of fiber in the morning and they're skipping that meal, I'm like, wait, 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 no, no, no. We're going to put that in the mid-afternoon because that's a key principle. We can't lose those uh, key nutritional concept at the expense of intermittent fasting. So that's something that I've been seeing in my practice and in my master classes as individuals are asking about intermittent fasting, uh, which again is, is fine to do, but I think it has to be done in a way that's looking at not forgoing those key uh, protective principles as part of your nutritional protocol. Yeah, I, and I would add um, to that, I think, you know, intermittent fasting, most of you have heard the 16-8. That's mm -hmm. kind of the most common one, 16 hours where you're not eating, eight hours where you are. You know, f for some of our, some of my patients, it, it's not that different from what they're normally mm -hmm. doing anyway. <laughs> so, so the impact, as you can imagine, intuitively, the impact that that would have might not be as great. And, and it's absolutely true, some folks during those eight hours kind of think, well, you can do whatever you want, and that clearly yeah. is not the case. But I think it's about what your goal is with intermittent fasting. A lot of, a lot of women do it uh, for weight loss. Um, so, and again, it, it can work for some. Uh, I have seen some pretty extreme versions of it. I had a patient recently who went overseas and um, did a four and a half or five week water fast, um, which was you know, just unfortunately pretty harmful. Um, and you know, fasting in and of itself, despite what you might hear, long-term fasting is not good for you. <laughs> it's not good for cancer. Um, there might be some minor transient benefits for other reasons, but for metastatic cancer, just be very careful mm -hmm. with prolonged periods of fasting. It, it does things to your body that um, either might make the treatment more difficult for you, might worsen symptoms um, with really no benefit from a cancer standpoint. Great. Okay. Great. Uh, Rachel, two-part question. Uh, the other four principles, everyone's, <laughs> lots of questions. You <laughs> said you had five, five principles. <laughs> oh, okay. If you could quickly <laughs> go through the other four, <laughs> that would be helpful. I thought she and had 20. I've got a standard 10 <laughs> for my master class. But <laughs> and I'll just, yeah, the second sure. part of that is if you would address fiber and constipation and diarrhea. <laughs> Yeah, so when it comes to fiber and constipation and diarrhea, um, that's where it's important to meet the patient where they're at. And it's really, really important to integrate fiber with, the, with that phased approach that I was mentioning. So that's why, like for example, with a patient or a class member, I'll start with the AM, but a certain period of the day, we need to get adjusted to that, and then you can start adding some more as the day goes on. Um, to get used to it because your body can adapt and it can become accustomed to it. Um, constipation sometimes, you know, even though you're increasing your fiber, that might happen. So that's where um, there are different uh, tricks of the trade that let's say I would share with my patients. Like one of the most popular ones is what we call the Get Moving uh, Flax Gel. And it's something that um, has been found to be pretty helpful in that you take some whole flax seeds, you put it in a pot of water, you let it simmer for about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, you add a little bit of Ceylon cinnamon in there, which also helps with nausea. Um, and it becomes kind of gel-like. And then you strain it, and then you have that liquid gel that you can uh, drink maybe a quarter of a cup a day or put in your smoothie or integrate it into your iced tea. And that could help with that is with constipation. Um, so there, are, and, that, and that's just one example. But, um, but yeah, so that's something that's important to, to address. Um, 
the other four things? <laughs> well, I can mention a few. Let's see, there's um, selecting premium proteins is a key principle that I like to focus on. So, and, that, and that's a big one. Um, when it, and we can you know, talk about that as well as um, premium proteins, meaning how to select proteins that yield the most return when it comes to um, breast cancer protection as well. Um, so that would be the plant-based proteins that I like to gradually phase in. Um, I don't like to take extreme measures with my patients, like if plant-based proteins are con considered premium and best of the best for breast uh, cancer, um, then I think that um, meeting the patient where they're at is important, and I like to have an approach where I'm educating about the power of plant-based proteins, but with a mindset of being more inclusive of these plant-based proteins, where gradually you're gonna to start to decrease um, your intake of animal-based proteins. And it doesn't have to be exclusive. Some people um, come to me and they're on a vegan diet, for example, and it's not the best diet. <laughs> so um, I think that uh, premium proteins is another one and uh, understanding why plant-based Based proteins are great um, in that they offer fiber, which is so important. We just discussed. Um, they offer a lot of anti-inflammatory properties, phytochemicals. These are plant chemicals that protect you on the cellular level. Um, they also contain protein. So there are a lot of advantages and a lot of great um, um, components to incorporating more plant-based proteins. So that would be a, another one. And I could probably yeah. keep talking about it but and there that's all what. of this is on um, <laughs> Rachel's website and we will make sure so much information there so I want to just try to get through some yeah, of these we'll really tactical that. questions so I have a quick one for Rachel and then for Dr. Meta. but so is flaxseed gel some similar to flaxseed oil and I think the question oh. in general is like how do you figure out what to buy like there's a lot sure. of flax out there a lot of okay <laughs> yeah um, great question. It, totally different from flaxseed oil. The gel is something that you actually make. It's very, very easy. You take um, about a quarter to half a cup of whole flax seeds. Usually to, to eat it, we recommend ground um, for absorption. But here you're just um, taking half a cup of flaxseed and about two cups of water, and you're simmering that on your stovetop for about 15 to 20 minutes. And if you put a spoon, you'll see that it starts to get a little thicker. And um, then after 20 minutes, you just strain it. You separate out the gel from the uh, seeds, and you're going to use that gel. And usually, I'll recommend about a quarter of a cup once or twice a day. It doesn't have much of a taste, um, but it helps to get things moving. And that's the function of that. Flaxseed oil is totally different and the whole flax and ground flax. So right. that's a great question. But it's something very easy to make. It's very, it's budget friendly it's, yeah. and useful. Great. I think I know the next question, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we would get to an exercise question. So oh. some people are can, saying. Can I just comment though? Yeah, yeah, I, I go, thought that, go, was, go. that was the question that was coming. That, that there, are, there are some, again, misconceptions about certain foods that are estrogenic, right? If we, yes. there's, I see a lot of women worried about, um, you know, looking at every drop of soy that they might have in their in a food. And flaxseed actually has some phytoestrogenic properties. Phytoestrogens are fine; they're safe. Now, you know, it, it, most human studies have said that they're safe. In animal and and some cell culture studies, there was data from a while back that showed that that it it caused some growth in a lab of the of certain estrogen-driven cells. But in human studies, that has not been the case. And in fact, we think, for example, in, in the Asian population, now they're a little different because there's a, a, already a higher amount of base, baseline soy intake. But when they increase their soy intake, they, they actually maybe reduced their breast cancer risk. So again, I'm not saying go out and buy you know, and eat tofu four times a day, but don't worry about that. Because the health benefits of these foods, the foods that have some estrogenic properties tend to be really healthy foods. and so that will far outweigh any you know, trivial risk that you might have from, from an estrogenic standpoint. So. Thank you. That's yeah. always a popular question. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask an exercise question because there's, a, there's two different questions. One is, how hard should women or people with metastatic breast cancer be working out? 
And also, what if you really are having a hard time working out? What are some things you can do to get moving? Mm -hmm. And before Dr. Maida went to medical school, he was actually a personal trainer. So always good to know. That's why I met my wife. <laughs> So the exercise question in metastatic breast cancer is a complicated one because metastatic breast cancer is not one thing. It depends on the sites of metastases. The ones that I tend to focus on are the, and that your oncologist will focus on is the, the difference between what we call visceral metastases, which are kind of the, the organs, lungs, liver, for example, and bone metastases. So bone metastases are what we get worried about as oncologists in terms of fracture risk. So before any woman embarks on a true exercise program, particularly exercises that might involve um, a higher level of intensity or what we call high impact. High impact just means both feet are off the ground at one time. So running is high impact, walking is not. But high impact type exercises obviously will cause more strain on bones, particularly weight bearing bones. It doesn't mean you can't do them but you just want to know from your cancer team and maybe you yourself, you know, where are your metastases? I mean, you're allowed to ask them, you know, show me the, the PET scan or the, or the CAT scan. Sometimes a, a picture is worth a thousand words. I tend to show patients, I, I order a lot of PET scans, some people order CAT scans, but the PET scans tend to have a good visual for patients in terms of what, what they're actually, you know, when we say, a femur or this or that, but when you actually look at yourself on a PET scanner and see the site, you can get a better sense of, of what that means. It doesn't mean that you can't do high impact exercise if you have bone metastases, by the way. It just means you need to know the extent of those metastases before you embark on something like that. And so, so there's a, when it comes to exercise, there's a safety issue that needs to be addressed with your cancer team, because again, it's such a heterogeneous population of women that we see with metastatic breast cancer. The issue of, you said, you can't exercise because you're too tired. Just getting started, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's, that's an important one because I think, again, the impression we have of exercise is this gut-busting workout where you're sweating in a gym or you're running, you know, five miles. I've never run five miles in my life. <laughs> <laughs> never planned to. Um, but it's, you know, exercise is what it is to you. So. If, if we have an 80-year-old woman with metastatic breast cancer who is primarily on a couch all day, well, for her, the 10-minute walk is exercise. It's real exercise. Her heart rate probably goes up. It's giving her benefits, just mental benefits, physical benefits, versus I have patients who are young women who are triathletes with metastatic breast cancer. Well, for them, that's a very different level of, of exercise. So, I encourage, for those who are really interested in exercise and kind of the specifics of exercise, there's the two organizations, the two largest organizations that certify personal trainers. Um, one, uh, which is what I was certified through years ago, is the American Council on Exercise. The other one is the um, American Council on Sports Medicine. They both now, over the last few years, have specialized certifications for experienced personal trainers in oncology. So if you go on their websites, you can actually search by zip code for oncology certified trainers. Um, so this way you don't get sort of a meathead who's gonna you know, potentially cause real problems for you. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Could you repeat the name of Yeah, so uh, the first one is ACE, which is the American Council on Exercise. That's probably the largest national organization. The other one is the ACSM, American Council on Sports Medicine. Great. Um, some people do not have access to integrative oncologists. <laughs> How, what would you advise them? Yeah, I think we're, so it, it's, I, I became board certified about eight years ago. And I think at the time, there were maybe a dozen <laughs> practicing oncologists who were board certified in oncology, hematology, and integrative medicine. Thankfully, that is not the case anymore. There are more and more that are doing it. It's still, it's not common, um, but for if you don't have direct access, um, there's the, the organization that probably gives the best advice nationally is the Society of Integrative Oncology, or SIO. I forget their, I think their website is integrativeonc.org. Um, but the SIO is evidence-based. It, the leadership team is, is, is truly research-driven. 
their oncologists on their, on their uh, advisory boards. And, and so the work that they do is, is, is great. They actually they hold a, a great conference every year, I think primarily in Vancouver. Um, and a lot of patients attend that. So I think as far as websites go in this era of misinformation, which we can talk for hours about, um, you really want to try to stick to places that give good, solid, evidence-based advice. And SIO probably would be at the top of the list for true integrative-based uh, safe information. That's great. So I'm going to switch the topic. Um, and I'll, Rachel, why don't you answer this first, but they would like both of you to weigh in, is what are the general guidelines for daily fluid intake? And um, some heard various things, like you should drink half your body weight, or, um, but also where is caffeine considered? Can you add that into it? Or uh, So anyway, just what are your thoughts on hydration? <laughs> I mean, I will recommend for my patients to aim for the standard eight to 10 uh, cups of, of water, glasses of water. I, I do um, like to encourage my patients to incorporate what I consider uh, or have dubbed like power beverages. So what you drink is also a vehicle to, um, to uh, integrate more protective compounds. So for example, um, some of my patients complain of, of bloating or discomfort. So you could make um, a, a de-bloat kind of tonic where you've got uh, a pot of water that you're simmering and make one batch and you put a handful of parsley, some sliced ginger, turmeric root. Um, again, if, you're, if you have nausea, the ginger is very effective as well. Um, fennel seeds are very helpful, or fennel tea. Um, I don't want anything to take a lot of time, so there are quick versions of this where you can utilize uh, tea bags and just simmer this and, um, and have a batch of that to drink throughout the day for comfort. But it also, uh, um, you're getting a lot of um, protective value by drinking that as well. So there are different drinks that you, you can make. Um, so I think elevating your beverage routine is really the message that I'm trying to convey um, in a way that is very soothing as well and very comforting. So um, parsley, the fennel helps with some of that bloat um, and, um, and gas or discomfort that sometimes comes along with treatments. And, and uh, so that, that would be a good way to do that, and there are various teas that you can incorporate as well. So, Great. I want to try that. That sounds. Uh, I know, that's good. That and the recipes good. are on her web <laughs> yeah. on Rachel's website. <laughs> um, so the hydration question, it, you know, again going back to metastatic breast cancer, um, the treatments matter. So depending on the treatments mm -hmm. that you're on. So for example, if you're on what we call cytotoxic chemotherapy, which which thankfully in the metastatic setting we are seeing less and less women on actual chemo, chemo, like you think of chemo, but a lot of chemo drugs cause nausea, sometimes cause vomiting, although we've gotten a lot better with our medications to prevent that, um, but diarrhea. So you wanna think about sort of your fluid losses. Um, some are actual losses, like through vomiting and diarrhea, and some are insensible losses. So for example, people who have fevers, you tend to lose a lot of fluid. You may not realize that that's happening. Sweats, mm -hmm. night sweats. Right, you're sweating, you're often drenching, so you're losing fluids. The, the rule of thumb, as Rachel said, so you know, we kind of will take half your body weight and, and you know, put that in ounces and say that's what you need. Now some of that, by the way, remember, if you're eating particularly a plant-based diet, you're actually getting water through food. So I think people forget when we make those recommendations, it's don't feel badly because water can sometimes taste disgusting when you're on certain treatments. It almost tastes like metal and we are all these descriptors. And so you, you are getting, it's, it's great to get your water, but you, if you're eating, if you're able to have plant-based foods, you know, the more water, uh, plant-based foods tend to have, particularly fruits and vegetables, tend to have a lot of water mm -hmm. in them. Um, but you know, this is, particularly in metastatic breast cancer, you wanna know what your electrolytes are, you wanna know what some of your blood work looks like. Too much water, I've had patients do this, um, you know, can really mess with your electrolytes as it dilutes out sodium um, and kind of things go in the wrong direction. So just make sure you kind of have a, a somewhat of an understanding of some of that blood work, um, electrolytes in particular, um, and kidney function and 
all that. Yeah, mm -hmm. great. And, and a lot of it has to do also with treatment management. So if, um, if you're feeling uh, nauseous, then having maybe a little bit of a ginger extract with some water uh, or with uh, soda water to help with nausea would be very um, helpful. You can buy just a simple, pure ginger juice at any health food store. And you're just going to use like a teaspoon uh, in warm water, in hot water, or warm room temperature, or sparkling water to help with, with nausea. So it also depends what's going on, but there are different beverages. But uh, the nice part is that the ginger has an anti-inflammatory effect, and it's, it's, it's a win-win. Right. It's a win-win. Kathy Jiva, go ahead. Yeah, lymphedema and exercise. Mm -hmm. um, she says everything makes her swell in her leg and, in her, and her arm. What advice do you have? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that, again, the research has evolved a lot over the years. So it, we're seeing less and less of it, thankfully, okay. as 30 years ago, every woman with breast cancer, thir about 30 years ago, had a full axillary dissection. Axillary dissection meaning you know, 20, sometimes 30 lymph nodes were removed. And then those women might have had radiation. So if you have 30 lymph nodes and you have radiation to, the, to that axilla, the risk of lymphedema is, you know, close to 50%. Nowadays, a lot of women are getting sentinel lymph node biopsies. Radiation sometimes is not done in those in certain settings. So in lymphedema, we are seeing a lot less than we used to. But for those women that have it, I, I think no, first and foremost is to have a good lymphedema team. Um, I, I can tell you, having been at several hospitals in this area over the last 20 to 25 years, different hospitals, and it doesn't have to be the largest centers. Some of the large centers can have great lymphedema services, sometimes not. So don't, you know, so if you are at a, in a part of the country that maybe the academic center is not right next to you and you have a smaller center, sometimes their lymphedema team is really thorough and, and they have the equipment. There's all this fancy equipment that Frankly, I don't understand very well, but it works. <laughs> Some, a lot of it does work. These lymphatic massage machines and the electrical stimulation, and I've seen some real benefit. I think the important thing is to deal with it as early as you can. Prevention is definitely worth a pound of cure there. But in terms of the specifics of exercise, we used to say weight training was an absolute no. We clearly now say the opposite, that it's okay. I guess the question is how much you want to push yourself, and again, this is where maybe a trainer who understands um, you know, what not to do is important. But if you find that you're doing upper extremity weight training exercises and you think that, you know, I mean, use a measurement, use a tape measure for your wrist, and, and if you think things are going in the wrong direction, stop that activity, go to a lymphedema therapist, and talk to them about it. Thank you. Rachel, what about, um, and thank you, Dr. Mehta, um, what about sugar substitutes? We always get this. I know what you're going to say, but you, we want to know what you think. So sugar substitutes I don't recommend for various reasons. Um, artificial, um, one of the key things to think about is our cravings. Um, it does enhance our cravings, and the more intense, and they're very, very intensely sweet, but the more intensity, the more cravings you're going to have. So you're gonna be looking for that cookie and that cupcake because your body is saying, I, I want that intense sugar. Um, artificial, I mean, it's, it's not ideal to have, um, we wanna focus on whole natural sweeteners, but even the natural sweeteners, I ask my patients to reduce because again, we don't wanna reduce those cravings for, for sugar uh, throughout the day. So, um, that is something that, um, and it's also been shown to maybe not be so uh, great for our gut microbiome. So um, one key thing is to approach it in a way that's realistic for you. So if somebody um, is used to putting, let's say, a packet of any kind of sweetener in their drink, I'll say, look, this is, I know how important this is to you because, you know, we're very connected to our beverages. and. Um, I have found that the most successful way to do this, and I did this myself, is to have a gradual reduction. So I'll say, you know what? For seven to 10 days, we're gonna go from a packet to three quarters of a packet. And we're just gonna do that, and then we're gonna go to half, and then we're gonna do from there and reduce. And then they might transition into something like a natural sweetener, be it honey or pure maple or, or date syrup. Um, 
And that also we want to keep to an occasional kind of like save that for your treats or something that you're baking, but you can really get used to it and you'll be amazed at how your cravings are reduced. And uh, another practical way to think about it is like when, it, when, when I transition a patient from a high sodium to a low sodium diet, um, and then a few months later, they taste something really, really salty. Their reaction is like, how did I ever eat that? It's so salty. So they've transitioned and they're used to it. And I think we can do the same with sugar and with sweeteners in general right. in a way that's realistic. So That's great advice. And I think that it, it, I completely agree with it, that the cravings, these, these you know, artificial sweeteners don't get rid of the cravings. And, and this sort of speaks to the issue of human behavior and how our minds work. You know, this graduated approaches to change are the way this works. So this is not, you don't want to think of it as a diet. It's a, it's a behavioral change. It's not exercise, it's a behavioral change. Mm -hmm. And I think when you look at it that way, it tends to have a longer lasting impact. Because if you look at it as diet, in your head it's a short term thing, and you know, once you're done there's a, there's a goal. It, no, it, it is a behavioral shift, and it's not easy. It's like quitting smoking takes seven times to do, it's the average. So same going on a habit, you know, it's about habits and how our bodies break and form habits. Uh, but, but artificial sweeteners, despite the, some of the claims that they actually cause cancer, there might be some evidence in animals, some of the earlier ones, like the equals and the maybe some impact, but it's not so much about their direct kind of impact on cancer growth. It's the impact on your brain and its inability to make those changes that you wanna make. And you'd be surprised what an apple tastes like when you really take sugar out of your diet for a month. Right. I haven't done that yet, but I heard. <laughs> I love it. All right, it's that brain. It always gets it. in the way, right? It gets I love in it. The way. Okay, a, a lot of people are talking about the time and expense of um, being a barrier to good nutrition. So do you have any suggestions for lower cost ways to approach it? And Yes, so there is a shortage of outpatient dietitians in um, clinics and breast centers. I know that we encounter that a lot in Los Angeles. Um, so private nutritional med medical therapy for specifically for breast cancer is, um, is expensive. Um, and that was one of the goals that I had in creating my um, eight-week transformation masterclass is that how do we bring something that, that would lower the cost that would be like um, the cost of, let's say, uh, a drink that you buy at a coffee shop or something like that to bring it even lower. And so where you still have something that gives you very specific directions and gives you human contact, um, I, you know, we have a dietitian that, that calls in and, and all those things. We really, really work to, to reduce that, to make it more accessible to, to individual. Have, having, having said that, it still may be out of reach for some, and that's where we are actually um, starting to get grants and um, reduce the cost even more to make it accessible to, to more individuals. So, my message is we're working on it in a way to provide something that can be more accessible and really uh, affordable, um, similar in nature to um, the apps that many of us subscribe to. And we, my goal is to have it at that, at that level, where it's really that reduced um, in having some, some care. Um, for insurance companies, you know, we're, we're gonna tap into that too, because I think it's really, really important. What we know to date about the role of nutrition in increasing thrivership, the evidence is there. We know it's a really, really good idea. We know there are no guarantees, just like everything else that we do in our practices, but um, it's there. And that is a mission and something that I am extremely passionate about, and I will keep you posted on it, but that's where we're going with this. Um, and. Um, yeah, I hope, I hope that helps, but it's... Yeah, I, I think the, um, you know, there's good evidence that there's many counties in the country that don't even have a grocery store. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, it's not easy to get the right foods for everyone. However, I'm gonna, this might be a bit unpopular, but I just think some of it is the mentality. Are, are, you know, are you gonna be a victim 
or are you going to be a fighter? And I think it's a choice issue. There's, you know, everyone remembers the movie Supersize Me. You know, it was the famous movie by Morgan, somebody or other, about he went to McDonald's every day, mm -hmm. ate only at McDonald's for a month, and he just was in terrible health a month later, which is understandable. There was another movie actually later that had the same, had, had a person going to McDonald's every day, but just making the right choices at those places. And turned out cholesterol went down, lost weight. So while I, I think there are absolutely, and I would never trivialize the access issues, which there are many. I work in Camden, New Jersey, a lot of access issues. But some of it is our job as healthcare professionals to teach patients what it means to be healthy in their context. What it means to be healthy you know, in certain parts of Philadelphia and, and the ability to be healthy is very different than other parts of Philadelphia and, and of course nationally. And so I think if we can teach people that even where they are, you know, here's the, just practically speaking, where do you go to shop? You know, do you eat fast food? Okay, well, which restaurants do you go to? Well, here's the menu. Here's the things you should be having from that menu. Because I will guarantee you almost every fast food restaurant has yeah. some, Cracker Ballad maybe is an exception, I don't know. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Most have a healthy option now because they can't survive if they don't. They know that this is all a, a profit-driven enterprise and people want to be healthy now. Yeah, and I want to add that it, it does not need to be expensive. There are ways that you can, um, even the recommendations that I make, I might say something like, you know, um, sprouted oats is preferred, and that might cost, even though it's available at Costco now, I know we both buy it there, yeah. but um, um, it doesn't need to be. It doesn't need to be. You can just buy oats, whether they're organic or not. Um, even chia seeds would cost, I, I, one of my interns, we actually priced it, it is less than going to McDonald's. Having one of our recommended fiber-insured breakfast can be less than going to uh, McDonald's or, or buying a box of cereal these days. It is less, actually. Um, so, but you could take it to, to one level or, or the next, but um, I think meeting you where you're at and empowering you that there is a way and it does not have to be costly or time consuming, or time consuming. Um, that's key. There are, um, you know, uh, if you can't buy a Tetra pack, let's say, of a, of a garbanzo bean or in a jar, you can buy it in a can. Mm -hmm. And some would say, you know, oh, but there might be some BPA and BPS in the lining. And we say, the plant-based protein in there is gold <laughs> compared, and it is pennies. It is about 99 cents for two servings of protein, um, which is a lot cheaper than an animal-based protein, um, and it, it really, we priced it out and it was, it was, it was amazing. It was amazing and quick. Uh, most of the individuals we work with are, we're busy. <laughs> so it can be very, very fast and convenient. If you have kids, whatever the lifestyle is, there is a way to meet you there. Yeah. And um, so, yes, it does not have to be cost prohibitive. I love, I love what you said. Um, so we only have a minute left, and so I just want to say that we, you know, we certainly understand the financial toxicity of cancer, and particularly when you have metastatic breast cancer, it is expensive, and so many costs, whether it's connected to your treatment or traveling for treatment or all kinds of things. So we're not, please know that is something that we're very focused on at Living Beyond Breast Cancer and very aware of. Do you have one quick question, Kathy? Because then I think I have to keep on the schedule seconds. here. I... Okay. <laughs> Are fruit sugars off the table? Or how, sure. how do you judge fruit sugars versus sure. uh, processed? Real quick, the magical thing with fruit <laughs> is that it's glued to fiber. So when you're eating an apple versus drinking apple juice, there are fibers that will help modulate your blood sugars. So, and there are so many protective compounds within that apple that are important for you. And if you want to level it up a little more for blood sugar modulation, which is important, um, you can add, let's say, a few almonds or a few walnuts that are rich in omega-3s, fiber and fat. You've got uh, fiber, natural sugars. That combination synced up is amazing and beneficial.